Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Better Managers Briefing. My name is Neve Mulholland, and I'm the Director of Comms and External Affairs at CMI, and it is lovely to be joining you this afternoon. So today we're going to focus on the long and winding road back to the workplace. You'll all be aware that the Prime Minister announced on Monday an extension of lockdown rules and the moving of Freedom Day by a further four weeks. You might also have seen in the press, in the press over the last couple of days stories about the government considering legislation to make working from home the new normal, the default option, and giving employees the right to ask for home working. So this all adds to the uncertainty that managers already are dealing with every day during the pandemic. So at CMI, to help our managers and support you to make great decisions about how you're going to support yourselves, your teams and your businesses, we've developed and launched a new resource called the Better Managers Roadmap. Uh, this is a short guide, a very interactive guide um, that will help you hopefully build back better and make some really great and informed decisions and help you develop skills and understanding of the new areas in which managers are having to develop their skills to respond to the pandemic. So those five areas that the roadmap covers are D&I, culture, skills for the future, employee well-being and of course hybrid working. So we're going to discuss those things in a bit more detail today and we'll be taking your questions so do put those in the chat in the usual way um, and i'm joined by two awesome guests who have an absolute wealth of business experience um to to help uh, to to drive the, the discussion today and they are um emma jones cbe founder of enterprise nation hi emma hi emma hi. hello and uh, Anna Price, the founder, mm -hmm. co-founder of the Rural Business Group and Rural Business Awards. Hi, Anna. Hi there. Hello, guys. So look, we've got lots to talk about today. Thank you so much for joining um, the discussion. And I wondered um, if we could start with just a general question before we dip into the themes of the roadmap. Um, and maybe you could tell our audience a bit about yourselves and your organisations. Um, but if you could talk about what the big challenges have been for your networks what have where's the most impact been um the, the the challenges but also if there is any um uh silver linings any stories of innovational triumphs that you could share with us um emma if i could invite you to to go first sure and lovely to be here what a, a wonderful mellow entrance to an event i love the music i loved your intro i'm feeling incredibly mellow right now Neve. <laughs> It's lovely. I love it. I'm kind of like, oh, I think I'm looking forward to this next 45 minutes. Um, but lovely to be here. My name's Emma Jones. I run a business called Enterprise Nation, and our job is to help people start and grow their own small business. Uh, we have a lovely long history with Neve Mulholland. When she worked within government, we did a lot of work with Neve. Um, but we help smaller businesses, so businesses with 0 to 10 employees, and in terms of the past kind of 15 to 18 months they've had, I'm, I'm, you'll have read lots about this, you'll have heard lots about this through CMI, uh, but they've had a pretty torrid time. So there was Brexit, there was COVID, uh, there's still restrictions going on. And so for some in the hospitality sector, it's still a challenge. Uh, but I have to say, and I know Neve knows this, we are um, a very positive organisation. We always have been. We're hopefully a place that small businesses come to get proactive support to help them grow. And so we definitely have seen some positives from the kind of previous 12 months. And if I just kind of chart a little bit about kind of what we've heard, what we've learned, is I always refer to pretty much the first three months, actually. So from March and the first three months through till May of last year, we look back now and refer to that time as what we call the dash for cash. So we had thousands of small businesses coming to our platform to say, what do I do? How do I keep financing my business? How am I going to keep my staff paid, etc. So that definitely was a very tense time. Lots of business owners were nervous, naturally. Uh, but actually, the mood really shifted from sort of May, June of last year. And what we then saw, and again, there's been so much written on this since, is we saw this huge appetite from small businesses for digital adoption. So businesses were then saying to us, I need to build a website. I need to figure out how to use social media. I want to find out how to onboard onto delivery apps. So this has actually been one of the positives 
is the digital adoption that's happened in the past 12 months pretty much is kind of something that government, dare I say, probably wanted to happen three years ago and thought it would take a decade. So lots of small businesses have come out of this very challenging episode as kind of more digitally stable. Uh, and certainly one of the things that we have seen is business owners' awareness of their own financial standing. So of course, again, lots of founders had to very quickly look at cash flow, how much was in the bank, what the costs were. So more financial resilience has been built in. And I guess that's just the final thing to say in terms of an insight we've seen from the founders that we've helped is the number of business owners who are saying, if mentally I've managed to get through the past 12 to 15 months, I can pretty much get through anything. So, you know, if you kind of take those factors into account, digitally stronger, financially more aware and feeling much more mentally resilient, you'd like to say that does give us some optimism for the future that small businesses hopefully now have got those skills of survival built in. Gosh, that's just extraordinary, Emma, isn't it? That you know, I mean, no one's, no one can deny the last 18 months have been incredibly challenging. But to hear stories where people have, you know, developed new skills, new ways of working, I think that's an incredibly important message for our for our audience today. Um, Anna, what have what have you seen? Um, so a, a little bit about our organisation, I suppose. So I'm I've known both of you actually for quite some time now, and you've both helped me along my journey. So I'm a founder myself, and um, partner Gemma and I founded the Rural Business Awards back in 2015 so we're about six or seven years old now and we have also launched the Rural Business Group and we as the name says on the tin we look after small rural businesses really um, we don't have a limit on the number of employees um, so we work with SMEs really so some of our organizations are larger some are smaller but many of them are micro businesses one-man bands based in the great British countryside so I really I suppose reiterate everything that Emma said um, and from our networks point of view um, we, we saw the whole thing so it was fear loss of income anxiety when things first happened and again sort of early spring last year we started to see things change a little bit and certainly in our rural communities and I mean I can't speak for urban and city based businesses but certainly in our rural community what's been really telling is this coming together of people the community spirit shop local you know by yeah because we couldn't move <laughs> we've literally our businesses have really really thrive they've they've thought about innovative ways of connecting with people you know we've had door-to-door -door deliveries the farm shops have done incredibly well mm -hmm. I'm sure you can all imagine um and i know that you i don't know whether you still spend time out in the countryside as well but i think that all of our um all of our villages and towns small market towns yeah we've we've just everybody seems to have come to, come together and there's been this enormous uprising community spirit um we've started to look after each other this have started to engage more with their communities around them so that's been one of the very positive things i think to come out of uh this whole episode and you know this the adoption of digital like emma's spoken of the awareness of people's financial positions and things like that we're hoping will put these put these businesses in really good stead to move forward um, and going back to the point of kind of thinking about everybody said for rural businesses you know broadband is a major issue and there's no way that we can we can use broadband or 3g 4g 5g whatever it's going to run our businesses it's not fit for purpose however despite all of that talk prior to lockdown what we've seen is that during lockdown it's actually not come to fruition. We, we've all managed to cope. Mm. We've mm. adopted these digital tools really, really quickly, overnight, if you like. And then we, we won't go back. Hopefully, and my fingers crossed, that we won't go back. It gives us access to, you know, we don't have to travel as much as rural businesses now. Where we were spending a lot of money on travelling into cities and towns, we now have the digital ability to engage more. 
Well, that's a, I mean, that's an incredibly, incredibly positive story, Anna. I feel like I've been single-handedly propping up many farm shops uh, on the outskirts of London. Um, but that's a really nice uh, segue into the first of the themes of the roadmap that I'd like to talk about, and that is hybrid working. So you talked about the benefits to rural community, uh, businesses based in rural communities not needing to travel as much. Um, and we've seen a shift in, I mean, a, a a shift in working uh, high, to, to hybrid working across the country, you know, with people being uh, having to work remotely. Um, and we um, at CMI, we poll our members regularly, very regularly. And in one of our latest polls, um, 61 percent of the managers polled said they expect staff in their organisations to work between as little as one and four days from the workplace. And that's an increase from 54 percent. Um, back in July 2020. That's a really significant um, uptick. Um, so I wondered what, what's been your, and I suppose Andy you've talked about it a bit already, what's been your members experience over the last year of working from home? Um, what have they enjoyed, if anything, given the challenges that we've, we've all had? Um, but most importantly, I think, what do you think great hybrid working looks like and will look like? So lots of questions there, but um, Emma, if I could, if I could ask your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we're, we're very much going through this as a business ourselves at the moment. So we're 33 people. So even though I speak on behalf of what we've heard from small businesses, as a founder, we are literally living through how to do hybrid working. And I'll come on to that in a minute because it's a challenge and everyone's trying to adjust, uh, which is exactly the conversation I've had with my team this week. But as I say, I'll come on to that. But yeah, Neve, there's been upsides and there's been downsides. So Homeworking, I think, definitively has helped with productivity, um, you know, not traveling, um, not necessarily having social distractions in the office has meant that I think we've now come to this clear distinction that if you want to get stuff done, you do it from home. If you want to collaborate, if you want some social interaction and you want the more creative solutions, you head into the office. And this is kind of what's bringing really interesting points for serviced office operators or even just offices. So again, if I think of the Enterprise Nation experience, we have completely reshaped our office. So we have an office in East London. I'm not in it today. Um, I agree with the fact that most employees are doing one to two days in the office and the rest of the time at home. But we've reshaped our office where essentially it is now a place of social gathering. So we've created soft furnishings, we have a lounge area, we've got a bar, um, and it really is kind of now, this is where I don't expect the team to come into the office, put their heads down and work on their laptops when they come in. And I, I literally saw it for the two days I was in this week, you know, one of the days we had um, socially distanced drinks because two of the girls have got a birthday and you could tell, and in fact, they've all told me they love that kind of feeling human connection again. So I do think the absolute purpose of an office has completely changed. And you get this kind of wonderful spirit where the team are saying on the days that I need to be productive, I'll work from home. When I need that interaction, I'll head into the office. What that is creating though, and this is one thing I think we've got to be really careful of as businesses, is a slight division of are you in or are you not? So for instance, earlier this week, we had the weekly business development meeting. And I think maybe there were about 12 people in the office and there were probably about six people who had Zoomed it on Teams, they were on the call. And at the end of the session, I said to those who were kind of dialed in, how was that as an experience? And they said it was really uncomfortable because we watched all of you in the office have internal jokes. You were giggling at some points and we couldn't hear what you were giggling about. And they said it was just a really uncomfortable experience. And we are, you know, technology can help. And in our office, we're literally creating what's called a Zoom room. So we've got a big screen that we've put up. We're having a table to try and get this sense of whether you're in the office or not, you now feel part of one team. And I think it's one thing that managers probably do just need to be a bit aware of is that you don't get this kind of them and us distinction. And, and we, for instance, we've got someone based in Manchester. We've now got two people based in Canada and one person based in Ireland. So they physically can't come into a London office. And therefore, my role, I feel, is how do I create this sense of unity where some people are coming in and doing online sessions from the office and those who are dialing in virtually. So I think kind of our job as managers is to check out what those technology solutions are to hopefully create this experience where 
everyone feels that they know what's happening in the company. They're all kind of moving forward and aiming for one thing, regardless as to whether they're coming into a physical office or not. And then just the final thing on that, Neve, I'd say is communications is key. I have never communicated so much, certainly with my team. I write them an email every morning. And again, I was saying to the team this week that because you can't be together in a space every day, you have to massively up the amount of communications that you do with the team. So I think communications being strong, using technology and desperately trying to avoid that division of, you know, whether you're in or whether you're out. These are the kind of things that I think are on the minds of people running businesses. That's so interesting and helpful, Emma. And I think um, especially on that point about Um, Because we're all, you know, we're all having to try out new ways of working. It's that point about innovating, trying new things, keeping that that constant communication going. So you're you're, you're working with your teams to really pinpoint what works, what doesn't. Um, And we might come back to that. We will come back to that theme of um, the potential for a two tier uh, workforce and how we how we have to uh, ensure that that doesn't become part of the the move back to the the workplace. Um, Anna. Uh, if I can ask you the, the same question on what do you think great hybrid working looks like? What do I think it looks like? Um, so from our network's perspective, really, I think that what, like I say, what is allowed us to do um, is to be ac- be more accessible. So rural businesses have tended to either you know, like I say, have to travel a lot or not uh, not to be connected with people. So we've relied on, you know, road and rail infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So technology is huge. What a lot of our rural businesses probably wouldn't do, given that they're, you know, either on farms or land or in people houses in villages and towns, is to have that ability to to use that technology in a big way. So our smaller businesses are going to have to find ways very much to be inclusive without, um, like like you said, really, without letting people, without meaning that people can not be part of it. So it's, it's rather... Having a Zoom room sounds like a, a perfect option, really, because you, you you will feel like that you're in the room. I imagine it's going to be, you know, quite an immersive experience. Um, we're not going to be able to do that. So I think upping the communication is key. But with the small teams that we have, I think it is it's that personal communication. We've we've actually seen the, the rise of WhatsApp and messaging apps and things like that is communicating offline as well as online um it's making sure that people's mental health is okay because what is very difficult also via you know via zoom or on teams is to get a sense of how people are feeling so checking in afterwards emma is fabulous but also people aren't always going to tell the truth about that are they so i think it's really important that excuse me as managers we are very aware of our staff their situations how they're working their even their family situation so what is affecting their mental health keeping on top of that as well um and making sure that yeah everybody's okay not from a business perspective and contributing and being productive but also from perspective of being isolated rural businesses are very often isolated um individuals are very often isolated within rural businesses so it's just yeah it's that checking in thing it's making sure that everybody's okay um being more human i think we've 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 seen quite a change in the way that businesses are managed and i hate to say it but a lot of the female founded businesses have done really well in this regard because there's that empathy and we don't often get that having my most recent corporate role a financial services organization which was very male dominated and i think that they miss that female element and we're not all the same but i think female founded businesses have actually come out really well of yeah. this um of this situation amazing no that's really interesting and actually we will come back to to talk about empathy and that being a really important skill um to upskill in if it doesn't 
come naturally, which it doesn't to all of us, um, and that need for really clear communication. But Anna, again, you've segued beautifully into the next theme that I'd like to talk about, which is well-being. Um, now, obviously, the last 18 months or so uh, has taken an enormous toll on so many people. Uh, yeah. Our normal ways of living are gone for, for a little while. Uh, families have been parted. Our usual working patterns dramatically interrupted for many. Um, it's taken a huge uh, toll and had a huge impact on our mental health and well-being. And again, in one of the most recent polls we ran with our managers, um, and this is, I think this is really oh, this is awful, but um, but it does give us, you know, lots of work to, to, to do to counter it. So 66% so of our managers said that home working has had a negative impact on mental health and well-being, both their own and that of their direct reports, which is such a huge number. Um, so at CMI, we believe it's, imperative that managers look after their own mental health and well-being as well as that of their of their teams um so putting on your own oxygen mask before you try to help others um i wondered and anna obviously you, you touched on it there i don't know if you wanted to say uh, any more about the experiences of, of the business leaders you work with in terms of um what what what's been working how have um they been best supporting their own mental health but also that of the of the people they work with i think it's um you know for some of the some of the organizations that i work with in my freelance capacity as a strategic marketing consultant what i've seen is that the big businesses actually founders of businesses with hundreds of employees have really struggled because they have had basically the responsibility of not just their employees, but their employees' families. And, and I know that, I know a few founders that have really struggled with that kind of, they've always had that responsibility, but in times of crisis, that becomes really, you, you can imagine it will, it will weigh you down. So it's so important, I think, to, to be able to put things into perspective. Um, you know, and, and many people haven't always been aware of how to look after their own mental health. You know, whether whether it is walking, going out for a walk, kind of clearing your head, not spending all day in front of the computer, um, taking those moments, taking moments to when you're at the top of an organisation, there's very often where else to go. If you've got a business partner, then there's somebody to talk to alongside you. But at the top of an organisation as a founder, where do you go from that point? You ca You can't. People aren't always comfortable showing that they are having, you know, problems or they're feeling pressure. So I think it's really important. And I know this is something that the CMI uh, are really big advocates for it. But mentoring is is huge. It's a really, really important thing to do, not just in you, you think of this for younger members of staff and people who need developing. But I also think mentoring, peer to peer mentoring across organisations for people who sit at the top is really very important. And I think that, you know, that kind of support worked really, really well to not, not really manage mental health, but to, to be able to work out when you are struggling, to have those conversations that might be a little bit difficult. Um, and I think, yeah, we've got, we've got to start to do that. So peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, side-to-side -side mentoring, as well as mentoring up and down within organisations is, is really important. That's incredible. That's such good advice. And yes, we are passionate about mentoring at CMI. And I know, you know, Enterprise Nation and, and in the Royal Business Group, you're also passionate and know the, the vast benefits um, that, that mentoring can bring to individuals and their and their work. Um, Emma, what's been, um, been working for, for your members in terms of mental health, well-being? Yeah, so very, very similar to kind of what Anna was saying. I, th I think it is all around um, acceptance and then communication. So um, one thing is we're doing loads more events on this topic. So I hosted an event we did a couple of nights ago, which was on exactly this. How do you make sure that your well-being and productivity is at its maximum? 
And so um, I'm so sorry, I'm just going to steal tips that they gave actually, but <laughs> lots of kind of fantastic tips. And it is, it can be the smallest things like create dedicated space in the house in which you're working so that you then get this wonderful sense of you can walk away from it once you've finished your work. Um, Anna said, you know, go for walks, do something that kind of, you know, helps you switch off from your work so you're not always on. So the one thing I'd say is there are so many events, so much advice, loads of support for people now in terms of how to accept maybe when they're struggling and then sort of practical tips to make sure that hopefully they can kind of get through it. Um, and then just again, if I kind of reflect on what we're doing within the business, and I say it's kind of all about communications, is that we've kind of changed the shape of the business to make sure, and Anna mentioned the word before of check-ins. So we now have a very, very clear organization structure that means that everybody who's working in the business knows with whom they check in each week. So at the start of the week, we have an all company stand up, then there's multiple, I mean, it, it's kind of terrifying as a founder because when I look at the company calendar and see how many internal meetings are going on, there's part of you as a founder where you're like, oh my goodness, all of those internal meetings means we're kind of not delivering. But then, as I say, you know, this um, change that we're all having to make means that that communication is really good because it's only through knowing what's going on that everyone just feels more safe in their role. They feel more productive because they know what they've got to do. So all of that in terms of communication then helps with mental well-being. So I think talking through things, taking time out, uh, these are all things that people can do. But as I say, Neve, I've never seen so much information readily available on this topic. And if I think, and I know it makes me feel very old, but when I started my first business, when I was, what, 26 years old, um, nothing was spoken about on this topic, nothing. And so now, and, I, and I'm sorry to say, I probably am of the generation whereby even if I was struggling with something, I probably wouldn't say anything because I am of the generation where you're running a company, you'll just get on with it. You can't let people know that you're not um, sort of happy with what you're doing. Um, so I think it's good that there's so much more acceptance. And then just the final thing to say is there was a brilliant piece um, in the Weekend Financial Times around how stress can be a positive force. And there was just a really good piece written, which is, um, and again, Anna alluded to this, if you have stress, there's a concept of reframing. So you have to kind of, you know, you're in a stressful situation, try and kind of take yourself out of it and reframe I think it's kind of essentially get a sense of perspective over what's kind of happening. And what this article was saying is you can actually turn that into positive energy. And I, I know I shouldn't necessarily joke about these things, but I quite often think if I didn't have the stress and adrenaline that I have in running this business, I just wouldn't get up. So I think it's it can sometimes be the adrenaline and a bit of stress that actually gives you the thing that you need to keep going. So of course, you don't want to have so much that it actually stops you from doing things. So I think try and reframe, um, but also this kind of point around communications, whether it's mentors, peers, just make sure that's rock solid and hopefully that helps. And go out and find the resources and find what works for you. And if it is that kind of, you know, rechanneling, uh, refocusing, uh, working with, you know, the kind of person you are and finding what works for you and the resources as you, as you said are just incredible these days so um for you guys watching do check out that section of the roadmap there's loads of advice and resources there um i'm conscious of time but uh this conversation it has been so 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 interesting um so another theme of the of the roadmap is I mean, incredibly important as they all are and that's about diversity and inclusion um so at CMI, we believe that the, the, the pandemic has made the need to ensure greater diversity and inclusion even more urgent. And indeed, our analysis has showed that uh, post-COVID, um, take up of remote working may be higher amongst workers with disabilities and those with caring responsibilities. I mean, there are no surprises there, really. Um, but with this, and we mentioned it earlier, with this does come a risk that they may become less visible to their managers and their um, and their teams, less involved in decisions that directly affect them. Um, indeed, with our with the, 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 some of the recent research that we that we ran, uh, more than half, about fifty five percent of our managers expect increased remote working will exacerbate the inequalities that exist for these groups, which is awful. And we just have to, as managers, we have to ensure that, that doesn't happen. Um, 
Emma, as, as you mentioned, I know Enterprise Nation runs so many events and training in the DNI space. Um, what have been the themes coming through for, for, for you? Um, uh, and what, what are your entrepreneurs and small business leaders doing to encourage and grow their diversity? Yeah, I mean, crikey, Neve, this could be a whole topic just for one <laughs> in its own right. So it's kind of, I'll try and keep this brief. Um, it's really interesting. Young entrepreneurs who were seeing, who are starting businesses, this is more around, I guess, kind of social impact, but they're tending to start businesses that have got diversity and, and inclusion completely baked into their business because quite often, and it's absolutely gratifying to see actually in terms of the next generation of entrepreneurs, what's driving so many of them is that they've seen something that they think is wrong and therefore they're starting a business to write it. So the one thing I think I'd say is that I think in, you know, if you look ahead to the future, I almost think we won't have to be talking about this subject in 10 years time because so many businesses will be like, what do you mean DNI? We just don't recognize that. We just are diverse. We are inclusive. Uh, but in the meantime, you've still got older managers like me around who are um, kind of running businesses and therefore do need to understand um, how to manage things. And I think there's been areas of progress. So if you look at, if you consider female representation as something that's diverse, um, again, a whole other subject. You know, I'm hearing now, somebody mentioned to me this week that um, the number of men now who won't sit on panels where it's all men is kind of rising. Somebody had said to me that someone had tweeted that he was on a panel that was all men, but that a female had been invited, otherwise he wouldn't have done it. And I was like, wow, in fact, you could say we're three women. Are we, are we kind of doing it the wrong way? We haven't got a man on the panel. But um, so I think when it comes to female representation, there's huge amounts going on. Um, uh, you know, and other, for so I think there's progress in areas. One thing, and this kind of goes back actually to the whole hybrid workforce, uh, what technology enables you to do and not to do, is to make sure that every view in your business is included. And by this, and again, it's just something I'm really aware of, specifically at Enterprise Nation at the moment, is, you know, certain people in our team, maybe in the tech um, part of the business, are not as extrovert as maybe some people in the marketing team. And therefore, what you've, again, when you were in a physical office, those who were more introverted would find a way to get their view across. When all of it is on online calls, you can lose that viewpoint because you literally just don't hear it. So that's one thing I'm just a bit aware of is how can you continue to create an inclusive environment where everyone feels that their view is heard when we're not together and present as much. So I think, you know, constantly on the mind of any manager is, Am I building a diverse team? A guy who runs a business called Charlie HR, it's a lovely business. He said a brilliant thing to me a couple of years ago where he said, um, he said to me, what do you look for when you recruit into Enterprise Nation? I said, I look for someone who will fit the culture. He said, do you know that you're doing it all wrong? You shouldn't look for people who fit your culture. You should look for people who stretch your culture. And it's one thing that's kind of stayed with me ever since. And, and again, so it's kind of things like when you bring people in on that basis of who will stretch our culture, that can mean you're creating a group of people who are quite different. And therefore, you have to make sure all of their views are heard. And as I say, you know, everything about communications is technology is great, but you've got to make sure those quieter voices are still heard at times when we're not all together. That's really, really good advice, Emma. Thank you. Um, and Anna, I mean, you are a champion of diversity. You're on our own CMI Women board and doing brilliant things there and a passionate advocate for neuro neurodiversity. Um, what needs to happen as a result of the pandemic to ensure greater, I mean, greater DNI, but also more knowledge about the benefits of really diverse workplaces? Well, the, the reason of I am passionate about neurodiversity is that I am disabled myself. Well, I'm classed as disabled. I have ADHD. So I was diagnosed at the age of 42. I'm now 47. So I am that different brain. Within a corporate organisation, I've always been seen as being that difficult person. I'm challenging to work with. That is why I am a founder and I work for myself. Um, and a lot of disabled people actually choose that um, that path because it's easier than working within a corporate organisation. So I think that corporates actually have a huge responsibility to consider the diversity in terms of 
not only physical disability, but also neurodevelopmental disability. Um, and Emma, your point about this culture is so important. What would it be or be like if we were all the same? The things that I bring to an organisation um, that people with typical brains, so, you know, you're talking autism, you're talking ADHD, loads of different things within this neurodiverse spectrum, I guess, that really do offer a very much different perspective to organisations that I think, you know, we've been missing out on, really, because people that are different tend not to feel like they're fit. So they move out, they go and start their own small businesses, um, which is great for the small business community, I think. But that's where so much innovation comes from. And entrepreneurs, if you, I bet if you polled, what, 100 entrepreneurs, you, you'd find that a very high percentage of them would have some kind of neurodevelopmental condition. Um, so, yeah, really important. I'm on my soapbox now, aren't I? I'll, I'll just continue on my soapbox. No, I won't. But I, <laughs> No, um, but I would I, I, I would just want I'd like us just to segue into um, the well expand that theme on culture, because that's another one of the themes that we explore in the roadmap. And um, you, you've, you've both mentioned certain elements of, of culture there. Um, how on earth are small businesses keeping culture alive at the moment? We've actually run some research recently that said um, that the, the results of which said that 84% of the managers we polled said that the overall culture of their organisation had actually improved or remained the same uh, throughout the pandemic, which is brilliant. I mean, that's great. How positive is that? But what are small businesses doing that's keeping culture alive? What, what examples or what things have you seen going on? I think I think from within within the rural business community, what we've seen is an acknowledgement of rurality. You've seen a lot more people moving out of towns and cities to rural. So actually, our rural communities are really part of that culture. So our small business culture is absolutely thriving. It's it's you know we're all working together. We're all facing the same sort of challenges. So that's like a regional culture rather than a business culture. And I don't know whether we might see that in sectors potentially but it, it, it's brought everybody a little bit closer together it's it's put less space between people I think somehow and the organizations that are successful in their communication I think are the ones that really will rise to the top here so whether they're you know people founding business women founding businesses female businesses will rise again we've got to keep that um you know the gender issue on the agenda because I think during the pandemic women have really burdened a huge amount of responsibility for childcare, you know, and all that. So we really must we must keep that um in our minds that we need to be moving that forward. But yeah, culturally, um yeah, there's, there's just lots of acknowledgement, loads of communication I think is is really, really important. Yeah, I certainly agree with that, Anna. Emma, what have you seen on the culture front? So this sounds really boring, but processes. So, um, and Neve, first of all, to the point of what on earth are small businesses doing? This piece around culture has got a lot harder. And this is where physical separation definitely comes in. And of course, this depends on the size of business you've got. So if you're kind of, if you are naught to 10 employees, which as I say, is kind of the businesses that we take care of, when you're just a sole founder, you tend not to have an office, you work from home, and that can stretch even, you know, up to a decent number of employees. But it tends to be that when you get to kind of five plus, you go into an office environment. That is where you can create a culture. And I know this sounds ridiculous, but even the physicality of putting things on walls of pictures of your customers or slogans that kind of represent who you are, going out on social events where you get to feel who is this company? What does it stand for? What's the vision? What's the mission? This kind of stuff is easier done when in person. And so I know it sounds terribly boring, but the way in which small businesses are having to deal, because I think all of us have to accept, and you mentioned this at the beginning, Neve, is that I don't think we will ever go back to all employees coming back five days a week into an office environment. So we all have to accept it is changed and therefore how do we respond? And I think putting strong processes in place around, you know, what is the culture? So documenting it now, when you have 
new employee join, making sure that the onboarding is so strong that they get the culture across in documentation and meeting with people, but not necessarily having to do it in a physical environment. So this is just another thing for managers, founders, business owners at the moment is not only do you have to keep on selling, not only do you have to keep on motivating your team, not only do you have to keep on figuring out how to go further and deeper with technology, You've also, across all of this, got to think, how do I keep this culture alive? And as I say, I know it sounds tedious, but I do think putting stronger processes in place on setting out what that culture is, how it's defined, how you deliver it every day is probably the way in which businesses are dealing with it. I think that's such an important point. Uh, yeah, culture, I mean, it's just so vital, but it's also the one that, you know, just you have to keep at it continuously to keep it thriving and engaging, don't you? Um, well, look, we've talked a lot about skills, but the final theme of the roadmap is skills. And obviously at CMI, we offer a plethora of training and resources to help people upskill. And indeed, we've seen um, an uptick uh, in, in people taking our, our training and using our resources over the course of the pandemic. Um, and I wondered um, if we, and, and, and we might need to keep our answers quite short, um, if you've seen within your um, your, your networks um, a, a, an ask, a, 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 a demand for upskilling, and if so, what skills have they been trying to develop? Well, I, tech, digital skill, <laughs> I mentioned it earlier, you know, We've, we've come 10 years overnight, really. So tech and digital schools and ED&I training, really. I think that, you know, people are, yeah, interested. Now's the time, you know, social entrepreneurship as well and corporate social responsibility, that 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 rise in, yeah, social, social responsibility, I think. And Emma? Um, definitely digital. And Neve, I'm not just saying this because this is a CMI event, but management, how to be a better manager and leader. We are hearing from so many founders at the moment because founders, you know, still are, as I say, the outgoing, the entrepreneur with the vision. But they've got to figure out how to become a great manager to keep their people alongside with them. So it's been fascinating to see the sophistication of business owners as to how they've said, I've got to figure out all these practical things. But how do I become a great manager in the process? It's so important, isn't it? And we, at CMI, we talk about the accidental manager. So that particular group of managers who find themselves in a management position, um, so founders, you know, small business owners, and just desperately wanting to do the right thing by their by their teams, by their employees, and really trying to get the, the best skill set they can to, to, to do that. So that's excellent to, to hear that that's what you've, that, that's your experience. Um, so uh, I now would like to take a couple of questions from our audience and put them to you both. Um, so I'll start with a question from Sarah. And she asks, how do we help new starters? And we did touch on this a little bit. How do we help new starters understand the culture of the organisation when we're all working remotely? Go on, Emma, you can go first. Well, I was going to say, like I said before, it's tough. Um, and so just if it helps, um, the way in which we deal with it is we almost don't expect a new starter to do anything for the first week when they join. So it's all about how can we introduce you to the culture what Enterprise Nation stands for, who we are, etc. And um, just like I said before, I know it's boring, but process plays a huge role in that. So document everything that your company stands for. And that's everything from how do you design your brand? Why is it even important to you that your brand appears on the left, never on the right? Uh, what is your vision and mission? You know, many companies don't articulate that, but any new joiner is going to want to know why do you exist as a company and therefore why should I stay here? Um, and small businesses, of course, benefit from all of this because small businesses tend to be set up to, like I said before, either you've seen a wrong and you want to right it or you're doing something great with purpose. So it's the kind of thing that employees do want to stick in with. But I think in this kind of new world where we're not all in the same place, I think as much as you can document, this is who we are, and then check in all the time. Find as many opportunities during the working week to keep on reinforcing that message. And as I say, I have never communicated so much with my team, but we've never been as tight knit as we are at the moment. We're all incredibly close. We're all kind of on a journey. Everyone knows where they're going. And that's about documentation and communication. 
Really important. Um, and then we have a question from Wendy, uh, and she asks, how best do we involve our staff in making decisions about how and where they're going to work in the future? So any tips you have? Um, Emma, shall I start with you again? Yeah, really quickly on this one, we do loads of uh, employee pulse surveys at the moment on exactly that. So um, just if it's helpful, um, the approach that we've taken in the business is I've made it very clear that uh, we have an office that's open, safe and available, but we have not forced any employee to do anything. Uh, we have a rotor so the team when they come in can feel safe that there aren't too many people in there. And we have let employees make their own decisions. And of course, I'm watching this all the time. Almost every day in the media at the moment, a big company is coming out saying that they're making their team go back to the office. And I keep on reading it thinking, I don't think that's right for us. Um, but I would just say, listen to your employees, check in with them all the time. And as I say, at the moment, we're doing pulse surveys about every two weeks just to say to the team, how do you feel? Have we got this right? Are we doing too much communication, too little? So just um, use these kind of pulse surveys that you can do and um, they can be anonymous. So that's just another thing is I do think it's helpful if you say that we don't know who it is who's saying what, because then again, that makes sure that your employees feel they've got a voice that if it's something that's a little bit more negative, they feel free in terms of being able to say that. OK, that's really interesting. Anna? I, th I think flexibility is key as well, isn't it? Because obviously <laughs> we're going through this day by day. Every all of us are, are finding out things at the same time. So it's absolutely listening. It's asking questions. It's listening. It's open open channels of communication and being able to be flexible. And, and no, everybody's got to be a little bit flexible as well. So I think that's really important. I couldn't agree more. And we've had quite a few questions about trust. And it's such an important fundamental part of hybrid working and making sure that we're going to make this new way of working work. Any um, last thoughts about how you make, how you build trust between managers and their teams in the current circumstances we find ourselves in? Go on. Um, uh, well, I, I was just going to be really quick and just to say, again, my history means that I'm not prone to trusting people. I, I started my career at a firm called Arthur Anderson, which I'm not being funny. The whole rhetoric and when you started in that firm was the longer hours that you're seen in the office, the more that you'll get career progression because people think you're great because the longer that you're present, it's very much about presenteeism. And therefore, for me, COVID freaked me out because I was like, wow, all of a sudden I can't see my team. And therefore, the way in which we've dealt with it, and I, it sounds boring again, but I do think this is going to build stronger businesses, is we have therefore done a much clearer objective setting. So we're really clear on what we would like each person in terms of the contribution and their role in the business. We then document that really well and we kind of keep that in check. So regular checks to say... Right. How are you doing? Are you working towards those objectives? And then, dare I say, kind of salary is based on that. So the way in which that we're trying to build trust is to build accountability into everything and then transparency. So everyone in the team across the company can see this is what they're doing. Are they doing it according to target? So the more that you open, set the objectives at the start, make that publicly available and transparent, keep on communicating as to whether the person is doing it. And that I think builds in a really good flow and therefore the founder can trust. I know what my team is doing because we've agreed it up front. I can see that it's happening. And then as a founder, you tend to back off because you've built that trust in your team. So it's hard, but it's definitely, definitely achievable. That's fascinating. Gosh, I mean, that I can see how that could, could work wonders. And that's great advice for our, for our managers. Anna, would you like to add any last thoughts on that? No, I think I think I'll just leave it with it. Seeing as we're short on time, Emma, I'm lit up beautifully. Indeed, indeed. Well, look, it's been a fascinating conversation. I'm so grateful for the to the two of you for discussing the themes of our new uh, Better Managers roadmap. And to, to you, uh, to those of you watching, thank you so much for joining us. I do hope you check out the roadmap. I do hope it's useful. Let us know what you think about it. We'll be adding to the resource over the weeks and months ahead. Um, but for now, thank you for joining us. And we'll be back with another Better Managers briefing next week. Take thank care. You. Thank you, bye.